Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's SANS webcast, why your vulnerability management strategy is not working and what to do about it. Sponsored by Looking Glass Cyber Solutions. My name is Carol Auth of SANS, and I will be moderating today's webcast. Today's featured speakers are Brandon Helms, SANS Consultant and Chief Operating Officer at Rendition InfoSec, and Eric Olson, Senior Vice President of Product Marketing at Looking Glass. If during the webcast you have any questions for our presenters, please enter them into the questions window located on the GoToWebinar interface at any time. Please note that this webcast is being recorded and a copy of the slides and recording of this webcast will be available for viewing later today and can be found on the SANS registration page. And with that, I'd like to hand the webcast over to Brandon. Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Brandon Helms. I'm the Chief Operations Officer at Rendition InfoSec. I come from a very heavy offensive and IT-based background spanning approximately 15 years. For those that don't know me, I spent a better part of a decade in the US Navy um, and at different three-letter agencies. Um, afterwards, I transitioned from helping the government to helping the commercial sector. Um, and my passion today just focuses around doing exploit development, red teaming, and then training the next generation of cybersecurity professionals. Good morning, everyone. My name is Eric Olson. I'm the head of product management at Looking Glass Cyber Solutions. Like Brandon, I've been at this a while. Uh, this is my 20th year doing open source and cyber threat intelligence for the primarily for the commercial sector with a little bit of Intel community stuff thrown in the middle there. Uh, I also spent, uh, in addition to being an analyst and product developer, uh, I spent about five years writing algorithms teaching machines to think like analysts. So. I have both a, a, an appreciation for the value of automation, but also the importance of applying human intelligence to security practices, and I'm excited to talk to you today. Awesome. Thanks, Eric. So what are we talking about today? Today we'll be talking about vulnerability management and the state of vulnerability management and everything that revolves around vulnerability management. Um, when we speak about vulnerability management, we're not just talking about having a piece of software on your environment that just scans a whole bunch of devices and gives you back a giant list of vulnerabilities. What we're actually talking about is the entire people process and technology portion of this to where we have the right people in the right place that are communicating at the right levels. Then we have processes in place that make the overarching strategy able to be implemented, defined, and then actioned appropriately. And then the technology, which should be agnostic to the people in process to enable the, the insight of new vulnerabilities as they enter the environment. We're also gonna drill into uh, VM program goals. By that, I mean, we're gonna speak about what is the objective from being able to take a vulnerability or the vulnerability management program and apply it to the business and the business outcomes. After that, we're gonna speak about patch management and patch prioritization. You'll hear me speak a lot about vulnerability management today, but it really is not just the vulnerability management piece of it. Vulnerability management typically resides under the CISO and is typically staffed by somebody who uh, grew up in a very security oriented mind. And their job is to be able to find or leverage these vulnerabilities and then pass it on to the patch management team. Typically, the patch management team will be housed by the CIO. So we're already bouncing from one sub, uh, sub organization to the next. And so what we want to be able to convey in this entire process is that it's not just VM and it's not just um, PM. It's actually the overarching strategy that we want to talk about. Um, we're going to finally wrap it up with talking about mapping controls to assets, threat modeling, and then deriving gap assessments. So with that, Vulnerability management is, it's definitely critical to information security. I know for me, I, I love being able to preach, uh, uh, protect your network or learn about your vulnerabilities through proactive investigations, such as running a vulnerability scanner and being able to see just at a holistic view what you're vulnerable to in your network. Um, uh, things for things for me to think about when I'm doing vulnerability management is not just about the actual vulnerabilities, not just about um, how vulnerable an application is or what vulnerabilities might reside on it, but the actual uh, value that's 
tagged to that asset. And by value, I mean, is that is that asset critical to my operations? Is it revenue generating? Does it house critical information or sensitive information that could um, endanger my company if an attacker was able to get to it? So that being said, we start talking, there, there are a bunch of vulnerability management models out there. Um, the most typical one I see when I go into these environments is a very water flow model. And by water flow model, I mean, it, it all flows downhill and it all starts with the tooling. So a tool will run, it will say, hey, I have a bunch of vulnerabilities. And then the VM analyst will look at that and say, hey, now that I have all these uh, vulnerabilities, I need to take this report that has about 10,000 pages to it. And then I need to pass it on to the patch management team and say, hey, action these according to our SLAs of our organization. The patch management team then has the over uh, the daunting task of separating out each vulnerability based off its its uh, its core piece. Is it an operating system based vulnerability? Is it an application specific vulnerability? Is it a database specific vulnerability? And then based off their determination, they have to pass it to the appropriate team to have it being assessed and to mitigate. Once they pass it to the team. Um, the team will then have to say, does this vulnerability belong to me or the stuff I work on? If not, they typically just ignore it and start working on stuff that is relevant to them. And then if it is relevant to them, the next step is for them to figure out what the coverage rate looks like um, and then how to patch it. And this includes typically setting up a staging, uh, staged environment or an environment um, that has no business function other than to test uh, features and patching on. And then once they have that tested, now they have to find a way to deploy it to all machines affected. And then essentially, once they've patched it from the patch management side, they just wipe their hands and say, okay, we're good to go. And then what we tend to see a lot of is the vulnerability team will go back and scan. And then many times they will still see that vulnerability introduced in the environment. But by the time it gets back to the patch management team, they'll be like, we already took care of that. And they'll just ignore it. So we see this giant waterfall model in which nobody's really talking to each other. Instead, it's just all flowing downhill. And that's why we're still seeing tons of breaches today. So when we start talking about the state of vulnerability management, right, we, we, we kind of hit it on the previous slide, which is the reports are long. They generate a lot of data, which is their intent. But what we're starting to find out is just because they're generating a lot of data does not mean that they're generating a lot of information. And so the entire job of our team is to translate that data, all 10,000 pages of it. And I say 10,000, but really, I've looked at some of these vulnerability scan reports, and they're just, they're just hundreds of pages of just data. And our job is to take that data and then translate it into information. So what we want to look at is what systems are affected by it. We want to then say, what of those systems, what is their criticality? How valuable are they to me? Um, is there a vulnerability released? Um, is there an exploit released? Does that vulnerability actually uh, affect by this system? I think a great example is anybody who's ran a vulnerability scanner in their environment has, has probably run across a web application or a web server that's running an outdated version of PHP or IIS or something. And what they'll see is if they're running a vulnerable version of, or an outdated version of PHP, we'll take 5.5 for an example. They'll see that the vulnerability scanner detected that PHP 5.5 was on the server and it listed 15 critical vulnerabilities that need to be addressed immediately. That doesn't necessarily mean that those vulnerabilities uh, are actively present on that web app. It just means that, hey, with PHP 5.5, we have a known record that there are 15 ways to get a critical vulnerability to execute. And typically it revolves around having exposed function calls or uh, endpoints that are using these vulnerable uh, calls to PHP. So that being said, the vulnerability uh, analysis or the VM guy will have to take that information and pass it to the patch management team. Well, we all know that whenever you start looking at some of these outdated applications, it can be very hectic to be able to say, is this actually using this call? Is it actually vulnerable to all of this? And it will take not only a lot of time, but a lot of research. And many times I've been in environments where the original web developer uh, no longer works there or has moved to a different section, or this application is legacy and can't be updated or replaced or remediated. 
And so we'll have to take all that into consideration. I think over the past few years, uh, the biggest two vulnerabilities that, that we love talking about or that seem to be great case studies is the Eternal Blue, which was uh, a zero day uh, SMB vulnerability that got released a few years ago um, that basically wreaked havoc because it turned into a great worm, which was able to take ransomware kits and just compound their value in a network, making attackers super um, successful in their attacks. That being said, Microsoft did respond with the MS17-010 patch. It was released uh, around the same time, but from the time that Eternal Blue got released to the time it was weaponized was about a month, which if you look at your organization's SLAs, a critical vulnerability is probably somewhere around a one week to a 21 day turnaround time. So if you go outside that by just a little, uh, then this exploit in particular would have already been weaponized and ready to go. And when you start looking at Eternal Blue, it affected nearly every Windows operating system when it got released. The next one I love talking about is Struts vulnerability or Struts V2, um, which hit Equifax. Once again, they had this vulnerability lying, lying in their environment for a long time, and it wasn't until Struts got uh, vocalized or um, this vulnerability got distributed um, amongst open source people that they were able to see that um, they could attack places like Equifax and be able to get sensitive base data. So what, what do we do when we look at this data? We look at it and we say, hey, this vulnerability is a critical or it's an high or it's a medium or it's a low or it's an info. And what does that really mean? It's always speaking in the context of a vulnerability at an individual level. It's never speaking about the holistic view of that vulnerability against an asset. So the value of the asset and the, um, the risk of the vulnerability is where we should always be trying to focus. But instead, we're seeing a lot of organizations just say, hey, this is a medium based vulnerability. We don't have to worry about this for three to six months or this is a low base vulnerability. If we never get to it, then that's OK with us because we're always going to have high mediums and criticals. So context is definitely needed to act on this data. And this is the toughest part to derive because every organization is going to have a different structure to how their assets are organized amongst their environment. Typically, servers are more valuable than workstations. Typically, um, intellectual property is more critical than a domain controller to senior executives, but to information specialists, the domain controller is the most sensitive thing in the environment. So all of this is a context needed to be able to action a vulnerability. And why do I say this? Because most organizations, we have a huge issue trying to tackle the vulnerability management side. I, I go to very few companies that can run a vulnerability scan of their network and walk away with zero vulnerabilities. Instead, what we try to preach is, hey, how about we do trend analysis and to make sure that our vulnerabilities are either stay, uh, staying standard or slowly decreasing, minimizing our risk and our exposure to attackers. So when we just want to start talking about these VM goals, we don't want the goal is not to apply all patches, although that would be great. I would love if uh, I could say that, hey, we have all patches deployed. We have no vulnerabilities in our environment. But once again, the goal is to minimize that risk to the organization to an acceptable level deemed appropriate by the organization. Right. So to so when we start talking about how do we minimize this risk, we need to make sure that we include the actual business owners of these risks. So, for instance, if we have sensitive data that's stored in a database that we really care about, we need to make sure that we know from the data owner what data that contains and how valuable that is and what is the 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 risk of that being exposed. And then that way, if a vulnerability comes out, we can say, hey, let's line it up against the value of this asset. This asset is very critical. So in that situation, we definitely need to patch right away. Default scanner priorities, um, <laughs> they're not enough, right? How many times have you been into your environment and you just right click and say run default scan give us some ip addresses call it good and say okay i have some criticals i need to action those right away i have some highs i need to crack uh i need to take care of those next and these mediums well there's nothing really that they can get from it well when an attacker gets into your network they're going to find the path of least resistance 
and they're going to find any crack and there's not a crack small enough that they won't try to go through. But the goal is to deter and track them and go after easier targets. Uh, and that's kind of morbid to say, but my my overarching strategy is I'm never going to be able to mitigate all my um, assets in my network, but I'm going to try. But through the process of trying, I'm going to hopefully uh, I'm going to make a bet that says that the attacker is going to get tired of trying to find a, a crack that they can penetrate on my network and they're just going to go to somebody else. So that being said, attackers do take multiple prong approaches to this. One of them is they're going to use one uh, one vulnerability to action another vulnerability. And where you might have two low level vulnerabilities, such as a directory traversal and either TFTP or a web server or an FTP server to where they can see the contents of a file, you might also have another remote, uh, another vulnerability that will allow you to execute if you know where the file exists. So by having those two vulnerabilities, they won't be higher critical in nature, but an attacker could utilize those on the same system to achieve that remote code execution that they wanted to in the first place. So that being said, um, we can't expect our vulnerability management team to be able to uh, always bring that logic into play and be able to say, hey, based off this low, this low, and this low, this actually is a high. But what we can do is say, hey, based off the value of this asset, these lows are probably more important for us to remediate than the value of this asset, which has a medium or a high. So when it comes to building an effective risk-based vulnerability management program, we just want to hit with prioritizing applications of patches, mapping security controls to assets, threat modeling, and then gap uh, analysis to make sure that our security controls are working and to make sure that if we need to introduce new ones, we know the exact place to put them at. So we start talking about prioritizing the application for patching, things we want to consider. How many people are connecting into them? Uh, we want to make sure that are these business facing? Are they internal facing? Are they revenue generating? Uh, we want to make sure that uh, our, our, our talented security staff uh, can fix these if they need to be fixed. Once again, I go back to the PHP one because I, I see this in a lot of environments, which is many organizations will invest a ton of money to fix uh, PHP 5.5, which will require them to bring new developers in, bring everything up to a PHP 7.x standard, be able to restructure the code, when if they would have taken a step back to see what the actual vulnerabilities had in them, they would have seen that, hey, my 5.5 app definitely needs to be updated, right? Because we don't wanna be running outdated or vulnerable-based software, but it might not be near the risk that's being reported by our vulnerability management scanner, because either A, this, this system's not being used for anything that's deemed critical, or B, it is being used for something deemed critical, but none of those vulnerabilities are actually being used in the application themselves. So just some things to think about when it comes to patch prioritization, right? How critical is the data that we're, we're wanting to protect? Can that vulnerability assess or asset be used to pivot to sensitive data? And when I say pivot means if I can get to that asset um, and it might not have anything else on it, but it does have a direct way for me to get to another more uh, uh, juicy target, I guess you would say, then that does start creating something I like to refer to as uh, residual risk or resist that doesn't, uh, risk that doesn't apply specific to an object, but to, um, to factors outside of that object. Will the compensating control prevent exploitation or mitigate an attack? So a prime example of that is I've been in many environments that are running legacy versions of Windows servers. And when I ask them why they can't update, they say, hey, we're running a Windows 2003 server. It has IIS on it. We're using ASP. The web designer no longer works here. It's a, it's a revenue generating application. And, the, and we can't patch it because if we're afraid that if we patch it, it's gonna crash the system. Oh, by the way, it's using SMB version one to do all its, uh, all its data transactions between other machines. And so we say, okay, well, you definitely should patch it. And I'm gonna tell you every single time that that's a major risk to your environment, but what can we do in the meantime to mitigate as much risk and to minimize the surface area by attackers? And this could be doing everything from making sure that your firewall um, 
blocks inbound and outbound SMB to that segment of your network to make sure that um, there are firewall rules in place that say, hey, only certain IPs can contact this IP. And it's also by doing other things such as, okay, maybe I can just exclude this one piece of this network to a, a pseudo air-gapped environment. And then I can put more security monitoring tools in place to be able to see when anomalies happen. Next thing we want to talk about is maybe, is the vulnerability present in a default configuration? If so, is that configuration present in our network? Afterwards, we'll talk about, is the vulnerability being actively exploited in the wild? This is one of my big things I like talking about, meaning that it's great that vulnerabilities exist in a network. Um, well, it's not great, but if a vulnerability exists in the network, then can I go to exploit DB or can I look at Metasploit or can I look at any of the other frameworks out there to see if there is actually a script that I can run that will give me that execution without me having to go read the, the vulnerability detail and try to craft it myself. And the reason that's important is because now you start bringing in the sophistication level of attackers. So for instance, if I know that there's a vulnerability that script kitties can just run a script, then that makes that risk much more um, um, important to me to fix because I know that I'm not just gonna have a small group of people trying to target this vulnerability, but I'm gonna have anybody who has access to this script that's gonna wanna try to uh, trigger this vulnerability. Is an exploit for the vulnerability publicly available? We just talked about that. Is an exploit for the vulnerability available for private cell? This is very hard to be able to assess, by the way, unless you just get on the forums and check or an IRC channels or wherever uh, your dark net provider that you like to go explore houses. And then how difficult is a vulnerability to exploit? So if there's not publicly available means, or if there are publicly available means, but they only trigger certain conditions, then does that condition affect my current environment? So map controls do assets. We kind of talked about this. Once again, when you do your vulnerability assessment, knowing what your environment looks like and being able to put those compensating controls is definitely critical. If we have two assets that are unpatched, but one is secured with a compensating control, we can now prioritize the other system for that patch. And then threat modeling. We, we love talking about threat modeling because it helps us identify high risk systems with little protection. And it also allows us to focus our efforts, right? The target centric threat model kind of, it provides uh, area identifies likely attack uh, targets. It also maps targeted data to systems and software. It creates intrusion maps detailing how attackers might gain access, and it also maps the security controls to the threat model. Once again, this is a very active model, and it requires a lot of understanding of business operations and business assets, which your security team should be able to work with the IT team to be able to solve. This brings us into the gap analysis model which is leaving vulnerabilities unpatched is often necessary due to limited resources. We've hit on this many times, right? We wish we could have zero vulnerabilities in our network um, when I run that scanner, but the typically the only way I'm gonna get zero vulnerabilities is if I don't put in a, uh, my entire IP scope or if I don't run the scanner, right? So what we wanna do is seek out appropriate and compensating controls that cover vulnerable systems. And so the way we can do this is by um, conducting proactive gap assessments so we can see what my coverage is in my network, not only from a theory perspective, but from an active uh, uh, assessment as well. So what I really like is getting an internal uh, red team to work with an external red team, because typically the internal red team or the internal security, um, they know where most of their vulnerabilities lie in their network. And they, they've they been beating on the CISO's door saying, hey, you need to fix this, you need to fix this, we need to prioritize this. But typically the CISO says, hey, I only have $1 to spend. And if I spend it here, then I won't be able to spend it in other places. So the red team typically knows where the vulnerability is, but the problem is they typically get tunnel vision and they only wanna focus on that one specific vulnerability to get remediated. To where when you bring an outside red team in to assess, they'll, be, they'll come in from the perspective of having minimum to no knowledge of that environment. So they'll do what the attacker does and they'll try to find the path of least resistance. And by doing so, they might uncover vulnerabilities that weren't 
uh, weren't either exposed in the vulnerability scan, or they'll be able to daisy chain those vulnerabilities that were in the vulnerability scan to prove impact of a vulnerability. So having those teams work together to be able to strategize plans for how to um, assess your environment has become a game changer for a lot of environments. Kind of wrapping up, right? Running a vulnerability scanner and telling IT to patch everything never works, right? If it's worked, please let me know. Um, for the many organizations I've been to, it always seems to be a water flow model that uh, gets that has a lot of gaps in it and typically has no active communications between the parties. Patch prioritization is needed to maximize efficiency of limited IT resources. So that means don't just bring in the vulnerability or the CVSS uh, score of the vulnerability, but also bring in another vertical to where we're bringing in the value of that asset. Once again, that value of the asset is derived by business owners and the organization as a whole. Then implement a risk-based approach to VM and patch prioritization. This way you take the, the small amount of resources you do have and you apply them effectively to your environment so that you minimize that risk and you minimize that surface area to um, attackers while getting the organization in a risk acceptable model. And then find technologies to assist in maturing VM programs and close capability gaps. Once again, if you have the right people and the right processes in place, then the technology almost becomes agnostic and you can hot swap those as needed or add to them as you find gaps in your current coverages. Awesome, with that, I'll pass it over to Eric and he can speak about the threat intelligence perspective. Thanks so much, Brandon. And um, <laughs> not surprisingly, right, I, I see every point that I uh, plan to cover and discuss with you all prior um, I think what's what's worth mentioning before I kind of dive into my slides is uh, working with our several hundred customers, most of them large corporate enterprises, I see uh, a lot of key drivers that, that Brandon touched on that are sort of shaping the argument. And as a the threat intel perspective portion of this discussion, right, I have a little bit of the outside in the adversary view uh, less uh, experience and less perspective on the inside one's own network. But I think whether you're an insider or an outsider, a lot of the drivers that are um, uh, causing the, <laughs> the titular head of this whole conversation, which is your, in many organizations, your current vulnerability management program isn't working and why is that true? There are a number of key drivers that I see over and over again. Um, these include several of the things that, that Brandon's prescriptions touched on, but I think they're worth stating kind of from my perspective. Um, the first is that there are there is often a lack of clarity about the purpose of all of this security, sound, and fury, right? And, and uh, I love the way you said it, Brandon, right? The goal of patch management is not to patch systems, right? It's to reduce risk. The role of threat intelligence is not to write up actor profiles or extract TTPs from FinTel reports or whatever it is that we do all day. The objective is to reduce the organization's risk of um, invasion, of breach, of loss of sensitive data, of loss of market value, customer trust, brand equity, money, et cetera. The second thing um, that I think goes along with that is a lack of clarity around the actual targets. And I think one of your slides touched on this and we kind of whizzed by it. So I think it's it's worth, from my perspective, double clicking on, right? Which is the database server is not the target. The data in the database server is the target. And there are all kinds of reasons why when it comes to the, the rubber meeting the road of protecting the organization, that distinction and properly categorizing what the actual targets of the adversary are is vitally important because if you can understand the internal perspective that Brandon spoke about, right? What do assets do? What type of data do they hold? What can they connect with? And you also understand what it is that the adversarial actor is going to go after and how they are going to do it, um, then you can better prioritize, bringing me to point number three, the extremely scarce cycles of the overworked, too many uh, things to do, not enough of us in the market, 
incredibly shallow talent pool that is the bane of the cybersecurity industry as well as the people who have to hire and retain them, whether as vendors like myself or, or um, you know, inside the enterprise. So understanding uh, what the actual target of, of an attacker or adversary is likely to be, um, how they're going to do what they're going to do, the scarce cycles of the people who have to fight too many battles and too many fires, so picking the right things is absolutely critical, which is the point of this whole talk today. Um, and then there was um, there were two others that I think we didn't touch on as, as much. We, we very briefly touched on asset and data classification in terms of importance or the, the so-called crown jewels approach. We also touched on the fact that in some environments for lots of reasons, including you know the absence of of more than a few surviving COBOL programmers, there are simply some systems in incredibly mission critical places that cannot be patched. And so you must look at mitigating controls and other methods to reduce the risk. Finally, the one that, that only came to me uh, in the last few days as I sat with the head of vulnerability management for a large telecom, he said, when systems that need to be addressed, especially if addressing those issues involves downtime, right? Yes, you can plan maintenance windows, you can cycle, you can load balance, et cetera, but for really bad stuff, and this is an organizational reality, not a technical one, there are only so many chits you can use with senior management to say, we're going to interrupt the revenue stream, we're going to interrupt operations, we're going to upset customers because it's really, really important. And so that, that organizational specifics, not just of the um, uh, systems, the data, the assets, but also the organizational realities of departments and um, revenue generating operations are, are vital. What that really brings me to is the following thought. <laughs> And it's, it's not my quote, it's uh, actually from, from someone we've spoken to, but I love this quote. Intelligence is a knowledge management problem. It is not a data aggregation problem. So in the early generation of threat intelligence platforms, the, well, even many of the current uh, so-called tips in the market, right? they see their job is to aggregate a bunch of, of structured threat feeds, maybe take in some unstructured or written intel, extract some indicators, feed them to the SIM, that isn't actually, it's the same mistake as thinking that the database server is the target rather than the value of the data in the database. And what I mean by that is it's not just about aggregating data or carving it up. If you cannot operationalize the same way you cannot patch everything, then knowing what matters is a critical aspect of security. And the role of threat intel guys like me and the people that I work with, right? Our role is ultimately to inform security operations, to inform vulnerability management about how best to use the assets and time and chits with management that they do have. And that I think is what, what some purveyors of data feeds and intel and intel management tools sometimes miss the same way that some vulnerability management programs and patch management programs mistakenly believe that applying patches is the goal. So Brandon obviously spoke about this at length, uh, but let me try to add a few Intel specific perspectives on this. Scan results are valuable, of course, um, but they don't write your, your Vuln scanner has no organization specific knowledge of the assets, the nature of the data, the value of the data, the sensitivity of the data, the compensating controls, the access or exposure of the system, right? If it's in an air gapped room that only Tom Cruise on a wire can access, um, that's a fairly good set of compensating controls. The other thing that I think Intel, threat Intel brings to the table is the ability to correlate what's going on out there with what's going on in here so that the folks in here, meaning inside the organization, can inform their approach to risk reduction, to vulnerability and patch prioritization with the outside or adversarial 
perspective. And I will, in a moment, take you through um, an example of what I mean. But generically speaking, right, it is the ability to understand, and, and Brandon touched on, you know, is there an exploit out there? Is it publicly available? Is it in Metasploit? Is it still under the radar in the dark forums? Is there no known exploit as far as anybody can tell? These are the kinds of things that that outside view, the external perspective, the Intel analyst can bring to Vuln and patch management and SecOps. If you understand, and, and in Threat Intel, we really like to start from, okay, a machine doesn't plug itself into the wall, right? An exploit doesn't write itself. Ultimately, there is a person or an organization behind each of these things. And like anyone else, they have patterns, they have habits, they reuse tactics, they reuse code. And so if you look at who they are, what their mission or objective is, what they target, when and how they strike, this could be as informative or more so than generic organization blind severity ratings on the vulnerabilities they are exploiting. So here's my, my simple example for illustration. Um, you could have, and, and this is mirroring something uh, Brandon said, but you know, we have seen this actually happen in the real world with our clients. And so I think that that illustration is exactly right. You could have a bone scanner that says, oh, these are your highest or most critical vulnerabilities. And as Brandon said, one, one layer you have to put on that is the internal perspective. Okay, I have 24 servers with this incredibly bad problem. However, they are all in a non-production environment in one facility that has three layers of, of firewall, two-factor authentication, and other controls between it and the public internet, and there's a total list of six authorized users, uh, then you may want to look elsewhere for what is actually a bigger risk to the business, given that those servers also contain nothing but cat videos. On the, on the flip side, um, and I, I love it's, uh, I swear we didn't arrange this ahead of time, but the, uh, the uh, TFTP and enumeration combination is one I myself have used as well, right? Which is there are two mediums in a list with lots of criticals and highs, but it turns out that if you check the headlines or work with a threat intel provider, what is happening is that a specific actor has been using those two mediums in concert in the last 90 days to pop companies just like yours in your industry with whom you are peers and who look and smell to an adversary just like you. Those two just became the absolute two most important vulnerabilities from my perspective as an Intel guy, because severity rating be damned, this is how someone who is actually targeting companies like just like you and has been successfully popping them recently. That's the outside perspective, the Intel perspective that I think uh, the threat Intel uh, vendor or provider or internal team, however you want to get that Intel, but it's important to layer onto those severity ratings, not just the internal knowledge of assets, of data, of the role of the asset, of the connectivity of the asset, of access and mitigating controls, uh, of, of the personnel and user permissions that apply to those systems, but also the external perspective of what is going on out there in the world that we can't see on our network because it isn't happening to us yet. <clears throat> so tying this back directly to effective vulnerability management, and patch management. I see the role of the threat intelligence team as an information provider, a source, right? I'm a classic Intel guy, right? Our job is, is to take tasking, it's to uh, collect information, it's to develop and produce intelligence and to give it to decision makers so they can act. In this case, I see the customer as the VM and PM teams. And my job is to not make decisions for them, but to give them the best information possible so that they can layer the threat intel perspective and that internal perspective together to make better informed decisions. And not surprisingly, I swear this was, this was not a plant, right? Our methodology here at my company 
and the one that is built into our threat intelligence platform mirrors exactly, from an external perspective, exactly what Brandon was talking about. The first is modeling the threats and how the actors behave. So we begin with information. We don't believe anything happens without human fingers at the end of the day, right? There is someone behind the script, behind the exploit, behind the automation. We want to understand who those actors are, what their motivations are, what their common targets are, how they behave, when they act, uh, do they act in concert, what is their level of capability. Based on that, assigning risk scores to various threats, and in this case specifically to various system vulnerabilities. So for uh, to use a, an example I am fond of, um, outside of the bone and patching realm, but I think you'll, you'll take the point, right? We had a customer who was explicitly being targeted by an actor whose preferred TTP was to DDoS their public, the target's public website. However, that actor had never been able to launch attack, an attack over a certain level of capability, say 100 gigs. Our customer already had DDoS mitigation in place with their provider for five times that. And so even though the actor was credible, capable, known, profiled, and active in their sector, for that organization's specific environment, the risk score assigned to that risk was low because of what we would call a compensating control, just like you would have for a vulnerability. And so the ability to map actor activity and tactics and behaviors to your environment can help inform those VM and PM teams. And that is threat intelligence team's job, right? As a, a TI team or a, a TI vendor, that's my job. They're my customer, is to bring them information so they can make more informed decisions about prioritization and the use of extremely scarce, overworked assets. And finally, right, to, to perform or to enable VM and PM to perform that gap analysis that says, map the organization's risks and vulnerabilities, map all of the internal knowledge that Brandon described about assets, content, uh, connectivity, sensitivity of the data, impact of loss or breach, et cetera. Perform a gap analysis between the threat actors, the threats they present, the vulnerabilities you have, the likelihood and the impact, and then make informed decisions that are driven by both internal knowledge of your environment and external intelligence to say, where am I actually at risk? Because <laughs> as Brandon put it, right? Patching is not the point of patch management. Reduction of risk is the point. So to sum up you know, my perspective, and I wholeheartedly agree, and I think you can see everything that our outside perspective uh, regarding threat intelligence as an informing input to the PM and VM processes that Brandon described, right? What we really care about at the end of the day is not collecting or producing intel for its own sake. It's to inform programs so they can understand a threat's ability to harm, the likelihood of exploitation, the impact, right? And those are the things that can allow a VM and PM process that better reduces risk which is the punchline of all of this organizational activity and sound and fury, right? It's to reduce the risk to the organization. And we think that threat intel properly organized, not just around atomic indicators and blocking stuff in a firewall, but actually informing about targeting and actors and capabilities and current TTPs and quantifying risk and likelihood. That's how threat intel informs this VM and PM process. And we think that's an important aspect of uh, allowing the, the VM and PM program to do what it is, it is its ultimate job. And with that, um, I'll toss it back to Brandon and our, uh, our uh, uh, coordinator. I think we're open for questions. All right, uh, this is Carol. Thank you so much for your great presentation. We have some questions ready for the Q&A. However, if anyone has a question for our presenters, please enter it into the questions window now. Our first question is, I am just starting my organization's risk-based vulnerability management program. 
what is the first step I should take in building this program? Um, yes, I can tell you because I've been in that same situation. I can tell you that vulnerability management programs typically have the most chance of uh, success when they integrate management. And I'm talking about not just uh, management inside the security organization, but management at a organization uh, wide level at the initial stages of this. And they get people involved early on that can be in, uh, driving factors of being able to make change in their environment. So where I've seen it fail is where uh, CISO has this great idea that we're just gonna buy a security product, run it, and then we're gonna try to tell IT to mitigate vulnerabilities that we find. So kind of to sum it up, uh, start off with building a workflow that involves key decision makers, because once you have them on board, then any changes or challenges that might be presented to you will go a long way with them on getting resolved and being able to make the change that you really want to change, make to the organization. And um, if I could add to that, you know, this is a, a sort of a technical step, but in my experience, I have found this is more of a surprise to people who start out than they first think, if they're, especially if they've just come into the organization, which is to inventory your ability to inventory. <laughs> and what I mean by that is I have spoken to um, uh, various security professionals, including CISOs, many of whom, because of the demand, are first time CISOs. And they are often taken aback um, in, in especially smaller or less sophisticated organizations by their own lack of just having the visibility, the, the basics of what is on our network, what is it running, what does it hold, how sensitive is it, what is it connected to, uh, just the ability to understand the environment can be a first challenge. So the, the prerequisite or precedent to that, I think, is what I call inventory, your ability to inventory. Do you even know what you can know before you start fixing things or patching things. That's been my experience in a number of customers as well. All right, thank you. Uh, what types of technologies are needed to assist in maturing VM programs and close capability gaps? Uh, yeah, thinking about that, can, can you say that just one more time so I can catch the first part again? Sure. I am just starting my organization. Oh, I'm sorry. What types of technologies are needed to assist in maturing VM programs and close capability gaps? Oh, OK. So they did say the word. They, they want to know about the technology. So I typically recommend always doing starting with the people, making sure the process works and then the technology, um, because whenever you're bring, able to bring the right technologies in, they're not just a value add, but they're a compound value multiplier. Um, so that being said, clearly you're going to want something that's going to be from a technology perspective has the ability to scan. So it really goes back to your fundamental thoughts. And if you did do this design or as 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 Eric stated, as long as you evaluated your ability to assess your entire landscape and understand the IAM process that you're about to start conducting scans against, you can now make the decision of, hey, I have only one web app, or hey, I have all my stuff in a cloud-based organization, such as AWS, Azure, uh, DigitalOcean's, um, or you might have to say, hey, I have a bunch of physical assets on my environment, and it might be best for me to get a host-based vulnerability scanner. There's a lot of great ones out there, but the ones that I seem to find that work the best from a pure vulnerability side are the ones that are heavily configured to meet your expectations. So I can drop Nessus in your environment, Qualys. I can drop Nexpos in there. And then out of the box, they're going to work OK, but they're going to create a lot of noise or they're going to generate a lot of data. So the more you're able to fine tune them and actually have them focus on the IP scopes that you care about or that are important to your your organizations, the higher chance you're going to have of deriving effective information from that data. Hopefully that helps it from a technology perspective. Uh, once again, this is just the scanning piece of it. There's definitely the threat intelligent piece of it as well that should also be addressed because 
you want to make sure that these vulnerabilities don't keep um, uh, coming up over and over again. And typically when a vulnerability gets exposed, there's usually a core fundamental process of that vulnerability. But that being said, we, one thing we didn't really hit on so much is many times uh, improper configuration will be construed as a vulnerability because it can lead to an attacker being able to gain that sensitive data. And I'll just add uh, two thoughts. I completely agree that you know technologies, there are plenty of vendors and tools out there. Uh, all of them have strengths and weaknesses, but a lot of them are all very good. You know, you could take your pick. I totally agree with Brandon's point. Make the investment upfront to configure it or uh, set it up as much as you can at the outset because back to my point about scarce uh, cycles and shallow talent pools, right? The last thing you want to do is take someone with, you know, years of experience and a master's degree in computer science and 10 years in cyber and then spend that very expensive, very talented person playing whack-a-mole, cleaning dumb stuff out of an alert queue um, or, or a vulnerability scan report. The more you can configure intelligently upfront, the more you can use those scarce assets both better for the organization and happier for the person because it is the bane of all of us, right, to spend expensive, smart people on dumb things. The other thing that I think um, touches on that, that technology question but also ties in what Brandon was saying a moment ago is Ultimately, the tech is run by people. It's configured by people. The people have to deal with the results. And I, I literally said to myself on mute when Brandon said something like, so we're going to buy this tool, we're going to run this scan, and then security is going to tell IT to start fixing stuff. And under my breath or on mute, I said, you know, and how is that working out for you? Because the organizational alignment uh, around addressing these issues, right? If you don't have buy-in from, from leadership, but also, you know, with your peers, Right, to say this is what we're doing, this is why we're doing it, this is why we think it's important, this is our approach, do you have any input? I mean, caucusing with stakeholders is, is almost as much of the job, in my opinion, as the work of turning the wrenches. Because uh, as one of the, the product managers on my team loves to say, and I really love this expression, when you are tired of saying it, they are just starting to get it. And so, I can't overstate, in my opinion, the importance of the continuous reinforcement on the people side. When I run this tool, there will be a long list of bad things that come in the print deck. Here's how threat intelligence and SecOps and VM and PM and CISO and CIO and director of IT and NetSec and the firewall gods who robes who have to benedict new rules all have to work together for us to actually accomplish the goal, which is the minimization of risk. So the tools are out there. You can do bake-offs or you know, read Gartner reports to select your vendor. I actually think among good vendors, that is less important than the organizational alignment you will need to act effectively on the results of a Vuln scan or whatever other technology is the topic of the day. All right, thank you. Uh, my company is trying to create a vulnerability management landscape for cloud environment. What are the key requirements to be considered based on your experience? Um, I, I think that's, that's definitely a very broad, right? It really depends on what is your intent inside that cloud environment. If it's just to be a generic scanner, then my recommendation is you go straight to whatever cloud provider you're working or that you plan to work with or primarily work with, and you start understanding their security profiles and how their environments are set up and how, how they lay out security, everything from least privilege to separation of duties to um, when they set up an image, is that image already deployed, fully patched? Is it working in some kind of uh, um, hollowed out container, some kind of Docker solution? It really depends on what the goal is that you're trying to accomplish. Uh, because as we know, vulnerability manage, or vulnerability scanning in general takes all shapes and forms, right? We go everything from the web app, which you're not only testing the specific web application, but you're also finding vulnerabilities in the human that developed that or implemented that code. 
And then at the same time, when you go into a Docker based environment or into a infrastructure based environment, you're now not only competing or you're not only trying to find vulnerabilities in the the systems and services that are set up, but also how that human decided to build that infrastructure. And many of these cloud environments allow a lot of automation to be put in place. So understanding how that automation is put in place and how it is used becomes effective in driving that that program or that that development that you're trying to go after. Sorry, that's a very abstract question uh, or answer to that question, I know, um, but it really comes down to the fundamental piece of what is the outcome you're trying to achieve. And I would just add uh, two thoughts. The first is um, everything that Brandon said during uh, the first part of the webinar still applies, right? Which is, okay, so I love the expression, right? There is no cloud, it's just somebody else's computer. So all of the questions we raised, what is that computer going to do? What does it connect to? What protections are around it? What data does it hold? How sensitive is that data, et cetera? All of those things apply, whether it's your box or someone else's box. But the other thing that um, you know, I've actually seen become a really big thing with a lot of our large enterprise customers is that those cloud providers, storage providers, et cetera, are to them part of their digital supply chain, their third parties. And so they often lack the contractual or established agreements that allow them to trust but verify, right? So the cloud provider or infrastructure provider says, oh yeah, we're totally secure and we do all the best things and follow all the best practices. And they literally, other than sending them a, a voluntary questionnaire or sending someone out with a clipboard, these large enterprises often have long-term legacy contracts that were written in some cases before the organization, the, the client organization was aware of some of these concerns. And so they literally don't even have the right to go and test or verify what the vendor or, or a cloud provider is telling them. So there is both a, a technical aspect to, to my perspective, but also an organizational and contractual one that says, you may not want to take their word for it, but if you don't explicitly give yourself the right to verify, to audit, to test, um, then you may be at a loss for anything other than, well, they said they've got it covered, so I, I'm just either contracting or insuring away the risk. Uh, wherever possible, I would encourage people working with, with those infrastructure providers to read carefully, not just the technical bits and bobs, but what rights, if any, they have to verify the security posture of the systems they have now given over by outsourcing. All right, thank you. I think we have time for one last question. Uh, from a technology needed perspective, where does inventory management fall in the list of priorities? I think inventory management is one of the most crucial pieces of this entire puzzle. I know we didn't explicitly call out the IAM or the inventory management piece of it, but this goes back into the scope of how can you properly um, know what's happening in your environment if you don't know all the uh, assess or assets in your environment. Um, so definitely whenever one of the first things we start talking about when we start building out our landscape and start talking about knowing our environment, it's understanding what segmentation do I have? And then of that segment, segmentation, what assets do I have on those environments? And then you bring in the residual piece of it, meaning that do I share assets with another provider or do, does another provider have some kind of means of coming into my environment, either through um, Active Directory trust, um, shared network, shared spaces, um, and then how does that residual risk affect me? Because many times I can't um, affect change on it. Um, so 100% inventory management is a crucial piece of all of this. Thanks for whoever asked that question. Um, at the end of the day, if you don't know what you have running where, then your vulnerability scanner or whatever tool you decide to use for scanning uh, these vulnerabilities will be incomplete because it won't know those ranges or those systems. Yep, I'll, I'll close with uh, an uh, uh, anecdotal story. I was at a conference with this, I was on a panel next to the CTO of a Fortune 50 company, and it was a conference related to sort of up and coming startups and cool things in the cybersecurity space. And he, he looked out at the audience of both vendors and enterprise, you know, CISOs and, and IT professionals, and he said, 
I love all this whiz bang stuff. My company actually funds a bunch of these startups. It's so cool. But let me tell you this. If you do not know what is on your network, what it's running, how it's segmented, and who can connect to it, you have no business talking to all these whiz bang little companies doing cool things. If you cannot do the basics, you have a much bigger problem. And I couldn't agree more with Brandon that it all starts from what the heck is on my network? And that, as I mentioned earlier, is a harder question for many organizations to answer than one might think. Yep. And I would love just to piggyback off of Eric and say that many times the person or the team that's going to know that answer is not going to fall under InfoSec. It's typically going to fall under your IT, your configuration management. So I have a few friends, Nick, Elliot, and Sam, who we came across uh, a few uh, a few IT-based issues to where we said, hey, we want to be able to figure out where assets were on this envir uh, environment. And we actually found that the organization theoretically did not know where these were. But when we started looking at their configuration management, their SCCM or their, their Microsoft uh, uh, configuration manager and uh, their net witness that was capturing PCAPs uh, and, and net flow data, we were able to piece it together that they had all the right answers. So that being said, it was just taking that information from the IT's um, databases and feeding it into a, a, a model that worked for information security to be able to ingest into their, their vulnerability scanners. And then the one thing we didn't talk about but has become a great risk in a lot of these environments is the BYOD, the bring your own device. Um, and when people ask, how do I, how do I mitigate um, those vulnerabilities? It has become a, a very tough thing, primarily because the organization doesn't own those BYOD devices. And BYOD is strictly for availability and ease of use for consumers. So if you ask, how do I protect against BYOD? I'd say, don't put them in your current network. But then again, that would contradict what the BYOD policy. All right, well, with that, we're out of time. Thank you so much, Brandon and Eric, for your great presentation. And the Looking Glass Cyber Solutions for sponsoring this webcast, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast. <laughs>